Meet PitchDB, the ultimate platform for speakers looking to make their mark on podcasts, conferences, and media outlets. PitchDB provides access to over 3 million platforms, ensuring you find the perfect avenue for your message. With AI integrations, your bios and pitches are tailored uniquely to each opportunity, giving you the edge you need. Join now at PitchDB.com. Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. From California to Australia, I am so excited to have Hank Paul on the show. Hank, your journey is so interesting. I want you to tell our audience a little bit about it before we talk about the big topics. But it really struck me how you had to go from turning people away who you identified with to realizing that you needed to be the change mm. and live authentically. So please tell our audience a little bit about your journey. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Annika. It's really great to be here. My name is Hank and I'm in Sydney on Gadigal land, the traditional land that we live on, you know, pre-colonization. And we like to recognize the traditional owners of this land. And my pronouns are they, them. So what that means for me is that when people speak about me and refer to me, I like them to use non-gendered language, and that's just because my gender identity does not really fall as being either male or female, and I kind of just feel like I am my own gender, and so I want the language that people use about me to reflect that as well. So, and yeah, as, as you kind of alluded to there, Annika, I have got this really interesting story where what happens and what has happened in my personal life has really just helped shape and direct my career progression and and my business development. But yeah, what you're kind of referring to is I got my start in wedding photography Mm. and particularly I grew up in the church. And so growing up in the church, you see people getting married quite young. It's Mm -hmm. just a very cultural thing that you want to get married quickly. And so even as a young person, I was very quickly introduced to the industry of wedding photography because all my peers around me were getting married at 18, 19, 20. And so I just happened to be the person who could take some nice photos of them as they got married. And then that really progressed into something that was, you know, very quickly became my full-time job. And in that period, I was then processing things about my own identity, my gender, my sexuality, but I had a lot of shame. And that was messages that came from externally and the community that I was involved in and the people in my life. No one ever really validated that being anything other than a cisgender heterosexual person was possible. And then that kind of infiltrated the way that I approached my wedding business as well. And so when people came and were seeking my services, and this was also before we even had marriage equality in Australia, but people might be having a faux wedding, you know, something that they wanted to acknowledge that even though it's not legal, let's celebrate the union. And they would request my services and I would very happily turn people away and say, that doesn't align with my own values and my own beliefs, even though internally I knew how much conflict that was causing because I was still reckoning with my own identity. When did the shift occur when you said, wait a minute, I need to, I guess it's very brave, particularly, I think a lot of people have a misconception nowadays that you can be anything, it doesn't matter, everybody should feel free to say who they are to use whatever pronouns are appropriate. But there's still a lot of communities, to your point, that are still closed and maybe Mm. not as accepting. So what was the final, and I, I know people can live closeted for a very long time and not feel comfortable saying, I don't identify as he or she, I am a they. So what was that moment, if there was one moment that happened when you made the shift to say, I have to stand in my power and realize who I really am. 
And I love the way you phrase that as well. I have to stand in my power because it really, it does, it's an empowering moment, isn't it? When you are able to fully embrace and celebrate who you are and, and all of who you are. Yeah. And I think it's really hard to pinpoint like a moment in time, but there was a season that I can speak yeah. to. Mm-hmm. And that season in time was when Australia had a very public and divisive debate on whether or not to legalize marriage equality. And this was something that the government at the time had decided we're not going to And it it worked a little bit differently because I know that in the US, for example, it was ultimately the Supreme Court that made a decision on whether or not this was legal or not. In Australia, it didn't come down to any Supreme Court. It was just incumbent on the government to either legislate or not legislate this. And they kind of shirked responsibility. And even though the public sentiment was there, they were like, this is not something that we want to be doing ourselves, but because there's so much demand, let's just have an opinion poll, essentially. It was a survey of the nation. It was not a binding survey. It did not guarantee that they would ever do anything. They just wanted to check the pulse. And so, they sent out a ballot to everyone's mailbox and everyone had about six weeks to vote whether or not they agreed with the idea of expanding the definition of marriage. Mm -hmm. And so, there was this campaign that was so hurtful and divided and I was caught up in it because we were talking about the two things that really intersected in my life, which was my identity and my career, my profession as a wedding photographer. And, you know, I'd slowly been coming out and coming to terms with myself over a period of years, but this was 2017, and it really all came to its ugly head. And I was like, okay, I either need to learn to use my voice in this space, or I need to be able to amplify others. And so, I chose to really just kind of get out of my comfort zone and start advocating from that perspective of, well, this is what it means, you know, legally and from the industry, but also then this is what it means to me. This is how it impacts my life. And that gave me that taste of, you know, inclusive advocacy. And really, it's all kind of gone from there. And, you know, now today, I speak about inclusion as a job all the time. (laughs) But at that point, it's really interesting reflecting back. Gosh, that was like the first time that I I remember like writing a Facebook post and being so nervous. Yeah, it's, it's a journey. It really is. And how did people around you respond? Were people accepting? Did you gain more clients, lose more clients in your personal life? Did you have to make major shifts? I didn't have to make major shifts, but I chose to. And I had the, you know, the privilege and the ability to. So I eventually, that was probably this like three month period. And it was in that period that I knew that I needed to relocate. I needed to get, I was at that point living in kind of a, you know, a small city and I had a really good kind of market and great brand recognition within this smaller Mm. market, but it wasn't a healthy space for me to be because it wasn't really inclusive of LGBTQIA plus people generally. So, I knew I needed to relocate and and I didn't have to, but I really wanted to for my own well-being. And then that made things really tough for the business because, you know, it was at the time it was a physical service-based business that meant that I needed to be at the place where people were hiring me. And so, then that really began a shift for me to go, how can I pivot this into a space that I'm not as required to be on the premises delivering a service and started exploring ways of you know, creating this online business. And now today, I mean, I've just recently launched a new company with my business partner, Polly, where we're doing, you know, inclusive marketing consulting. And so, we can kind of be anywhere in the world. We love to meet our clients in person and and a lot of our clients are based here in Sydney, but it's not contingent on, you know, whereas wedding photography, you must be there in person. Yeah. And there are two separate things that we're talking about besides your businesses, right? the use of your pronouns, and that is separate from, I mean, gender and sexuality are, are different things. To mm, uh. So, 
I think that is something that we also should acknowledge and talk about a little bit, if you don't mind, because not a lot of people understand. It's funny because when we're having a conversation and we're talking about somebody, we may say they or them without even because yeah, we don't say he or she, right? But then when it comes to one person individually, for some reason, sometimes people can't make that shift. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I really love thinking about gender as this grand universe, if you will. Like there are so many stars and planets and asteroids that exist in our universe that are all unique and distinct. Mm -hmm. And just as there are so many stars in the universe, there are so many people on Earth and everyone has their own gender. Everyone has their own way of expressing themselves, their own way of how they feel in their body, their own way that they think about themselves. And we love, as humans, like, there is nothing wrong with a label if it helps us to understand. So, we love this label of man and woman as a way of bringing those things that are common together and go, well, all these people have these things in common and we've got a label woman and all these things that these people have in common, we've got a label for man. There's nothing wrong with having some labels to help us kind of categorize and understand. But I think where people struggle is when someone goes, you know what, those two options aren't enough for me. (laughs) And there is something else beyond one or two of those options that I want to explore. And- what I try to speak to when it comes to, you know, gender diversity is this fact that actually everyone's gender is unique. Mm-hmm. We may have used labels and we may use words that bring those kind of clump people together, but actually, like, Annika, your gender is completely unique to you and you can use language that helps you identify it. But if you want to change that language, it's always available. It's a fluid and moving thing. And I think when I realized that for myself, that was such a liberating space. It was something that it gave me permission to not have to live up to expectations or stereotypes. And it it let me go back to almost like finding back my childhood self. Uh Knowing like, what did little Hank enjoy? And what did little Hank really, really want out of life? And I think I'm a happier, more vibrant person when I embrace that my gender is my own and I don't need to conform to any expectation there. That is such a beautiful reframing and storytelling that makes it easy, I think, for people who might not understand. Now, I personally do have a lot of friends who are different genders. I have family members who identify in different ways, trans, bi, gender fluid, very, you know, all over the place. And I also have a teenage daughter. What I think is really beautiful about her generation is that they're so accepting of, she said, oh, this friend is this, this friend is this, and that's, nobody cares, right? Mm, uh And I think it's because we've grown up with these constructs that it can be harder for people, especially people who are now in control of companies, right? And have controlling Mm -hmm. the advertising and marketing budgets and the policies of an organization. And so that's where somebody like you becomes really important because you can share and you're not, you're saying it so gently and eloquently, right? And in a way that I think would be really easy for people to start going, ah, okay, now I have an understanding. So I I just really appreciate that. And I know in the United States, we have initiatives like the Association of National Advertisers has the Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing, which I love and I've been a member of. And it's fantastic to go and see how they're shifting Um, advertising, whether it's print or commercials, to look like and really make sure we're honoring everybody. So I'd love to hear about some of your work. Are you keynoting? Are you workshopping with people? Are you walking them through situations? And and are you working with ad agencies? Are they bringing you in to so that you can say yes, no, or the other? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, there's lots of questions sorry, there, I so hopefully I, hopefully I remember yeah, them sorry. all. I, <laughs> it's no, my ADD, so I have lots of thoughts at once, I have to get out. <laughs> and there's so much to unpack, so I, I really do want to share all of that with you. Yeah. But make sure you bring me back if I miss anything. So I think I want to just go back and touch on exactly what you brought up about like your daughter and that friendship circle and 
people's understanding of gender is evolving, that this emerging generation, Gen Z, Mm -hmm. are seeing the fluidity in gender. And, you know, there is some really great data around the fact that one in four Gen Z say that they think they will change their gender identity at least once in their lifetime. So, 25% of Gen Z are open to the idea that they might change their gender identity. We also pair that with the fact that Gen Z are the fastest growing consumer group at the moment. So, they are going to be the largest consumer group in five or 10 years with the most expendable income. And here in Australia, we just had a research release that 30% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQIA+. So, one in three. Now, I don't know exactly if that matches with the US, but I know that it's close. Mm -hmm. So, we are talking about a huge portion of the market and the emerging market. And if brands can't figure out how to speak authentically to these audiences without being awkward or tokenistic, then they're going to be left behind. And I love that you kind of mentioned some of the associations in the US that are already speaking about this. And in my experience, like most brands are aware, they have a level of awareness. The challenge then is like, what actions can they take and how can they do that without rainbow washing, without being tokenistic? They don't know. They often don't know. And or they don't know how to do it in a way that feels on brand. Like the only thing that they've seen is like, well, if we just change our logo to be a rainbow yeah. and say, like, well, if, if that's not on brand for you, then don't do it. Also, right. it looks really tacky, <laughs> you know, like it, it and, looks and, like you're just, yeah, celebrating one day or one month a year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so what do you do year round? Because queer people exist every day of the year right. in all spaces. So what are you doing year round in all of your branded spaces to say, like we see you and we celebrate you and we want you to feel really comfortable and really safe when you interact with our brand. And that's just a big challenge that everyone is facing right now and doing that in a way that manages, you know, potential reputational damage. If you're worried about cancellation, if you're worried about people on the right saying things about your brand that you don't want to be said about you. So, you have to navigate all of those priorities to figure out, well, what's setting you up best for a long-term brand strategy? And the brands that are doing it well know that they're in it for the long haul. They understand the changing of demographics and they're going to win big in five or 10 years. And so, what we do at They Connect is we come in and we partner with brands and we help you know, we, I mean, we can do a myriad of things. We deliver a lot of training for marketers. So, mm-hmm. specifically, you know, lots of DEI training exists, but our training is very unique in that it is developed by marketers for marketers. And we're not really, you know, I had this conversation with someone the other day, like our content and our training is not very helpful for the person sitting in finance, but it's absolutely going to be helpful for the person sitting in accounts. And that is the difference for us is that we aren't bringing a HR lens. We bring that marketing lens. Also, you mentioned as well, You are we working with agencies? And we've done a lot of research in this space. We've had a lot of conversations. And then also it's just looking at what's being validated by what clients you book. And the reality is that agencies just don't have the decision-making power or the Mm. budget at the moment. And so, we work directly with brands. And then we say to the brands, bring us into your existing agency and we can work on that campaign together. But most agencies, they have all the good intentions, but they say, if the brand doesn't want it, why would we pay for it? And that's a very valid answer. So, we work directly with brands and that's our target. But we, you know, we have lots of conversations with agencies because they want to do this well, but they then need to go back to the brand and essentially introduce us to the brand and then we build that relationship from scratch. Yeah. That is such a good point though. And it's something else I want to touch on because I love that on your website, you have your values right there. Mm -hmm. When I teach branding to clients or students, because I teach at uni, I always do it from a construct of knowing your personal brand first. So who are you? What is your purpose, your vision, your mission? What are your values? Because if you can start there and you can take that through everything you do, 
I feel like you're going to have better opportunities. You're going to be in tune. You're not going to take that job that you think pays really well, but the value system is not the same. And Mm -hmm. I do see that a lot of agencies where individuals at the top of agencies might have certain values, but they'll still take clients who are not a value match. And that to me becomes an issue. I've actually left companies because of that, because I, like you, I want to have my values up front. I want to work with people who are aligned. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say how much I appreciate that you state that. But then I also know that some of the work that you do, you have to work to change that tide and perhaps work with people who might not completely align. No. Has that situation come up for you and your business partner? Is it, how do you manage that? We've had conversations about an ethical charter where we're able to kind of measure brands and potential clients through a lens of, do they meet our standard of what we would expect for a brand to exist in the world. And there are plenty of brands that we can point to and say, you know what, we don't want to work with them. And we just know that intuitively, but how can we kind of measure that for those gray areas that you're like, you know what, some things they do are good. Some things are a bit questionable. Would we want to work with them? I think that like, if we really want to speak to equality, then Queer people are everywhere and deserve to feel safe, seen, and celebrated in all messaging and all marketing. And so I do have a sense of like, look, do I want to see authentic queer representation in, you know, vaping advertisement? Yes, I do. Do I want vaping advertisement to exist? (laughs) Not particularly. So there is an interesting balance there, but I think that comes back to then those values that you spoke about is I am, uh, I don't know if you know much about the Enneagram, Annika, but I'm Enneagram 3. And a lot of the work that I do, I love external validation. I love the recognition. I've got a big ego. Like, I'm aware about these things about myself. (laughs) And so, I really have to sit and anchor myself in those values. And those values have been rigorously developed over years and they evolve. They're not static either. Mm. But for me, it is so important that I have something to come back to because otherwise I do have a tendency to get carried away. And I, I, you know, it's not because it's, you know, with bad intention. It's just because if someone is feeding my ego, then I would very happily just like be wandering down the path with them and then realize when it's too like, oh, Uh. I don't want to work with you. (laughs) I, I do need to have that anchor or that home base that is centering all the work that I do. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate our conversation and how open you are. These are all things that we all have to think about, whether we're employees or entrepreneurs. Um, And when we're starting businesses, how do we want to show up, right? And how are we going to make sure that we have check marks along the way to make sure we're not getting off track? Or maybe there is a big pivot we need to make. And you do... So many things. You still have a photography studio. You have Authentic Allyship Academy Mm -hmm. program that you connect. And you also co-host a podcast. I do. I do. (laughs) We've had, I mean, you've just listed off all the things that I'm doing. And so the podcast has had a hiatus since (laughs) uh, October, I think. But my beautiful co-host, CJ, he lives in Austin, Texas. He's one of my best friends. And so we love to just have conversations about, you know, ethical capitalism and inclusive marketing and how can we do this all better. And so we started this podcast, it was in COVID times. And yeah, you know, it's one of my favorite hobbies, I would say, because I get to catch up with one of my favorite humans to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. And yeah, I mean, there's 50 episodes that you can go back and listen to. We will return to it. But, you know, I'm trying to make the most of my 32 hours in a day and (laughs) sometimes you don't have enough. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's so many things, you know, the photography studio exists in, you know, I still am shooting weddings, but I am really... You know, I've I've outsourced most of the rest of that business to ensure that I'm providing the most amount of value I can on a wedding day without necessarily needing to be doing too much more. So, yeah, yeah, there's lots going on. Yeah. But how do you find downtime if you do? Or I know for myself, I'm doing a lot of different things. People are always like, how do you handle it all? And I said, well, I've been niching down 
And everything I do is congruent. It all has to do with my values. It's all stuff I love doing. And even if other people can't, I see the through line, right? Mm. And I also enjoy it so much that I don't miss the going out. You know, I don't miss all the things that I might have replaced it with as much. So how Mm. do you find that? Because this is balance doesn't really exist. We all have to kind of figure out like what's our priority at any one point in time. Yeah. And it's an interesting space to be in that I'm an entrepreneur and an advocate. Yeah. And both things are very taxing in different ways. And entrepreneurship comes with a lot of instability and lack of security. You also have a lot of freedom for creativity and autonomy, all those things. But then advocacy, it really puts you in the firing line because what I'm choosing to do is use my voice to speak up for people who aren't yet ready or or can't use their own voices. So I do get like quite a bit of trolling on TikTok and I get a lot of like, you know, like because what I bring to the world is a new vision of how the world could be. And there's plenty of people who don't want that. There's plenty of people who can find lots of reasons why not to celebrate that exciting future. And so I often bear the brunt of that. And so I do think that the way that I balance that from a kind of emotional and psychological perspective, firstly, I have an amazing therapist and he has been with me for seven years and- I love him. But then secondly, it, I think it's the community that I've built around me and it's the people that I know that I can draw on for building me up and giving me energy. Or if I say, hey, I need a low key night. I need to not speak to anyone, but I need someone in the room. Can we just hang out? <laughs> it's those people in my world that I think really help me keep that balance. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Has there been a time that you've had to make a hard decision about a client on either any of your businesses where you were brought in to help them, perhaps, and you just realized that it wasn't a fit? No. Yeah, you put me on the spot with that one, Annika. (laughs) Maybe it hasn't, but I know that I've, like other entrepreneurs, also struggle with that sometimes. I mean, it's like you go down that road with a client, right? Because you're feeling really good about it and you're getting maybe off the path a little bit and then you look back and go, wait a minute, this is not going to work and you have to Um, separate and it's not always fun or easy, right? But Yeah, I think what comes to mind is maybe not like the sexy answer that you're after, but like in that transition when I really started to speak up about marriage equality and I was a full-time wedding photographer, I still had lots of, you know, the nature of wedding photography is you're booking clients 12, 18, sometimes 24 months in advance. And so someone who books you one day when your brand represents one thing, you might, your brand could evolve, but they've still hired you based on what you used to represent. And so I was in this period that was really, really hard where I was still photographing weddings uh, of folks who had hired me before I had come out publicly, before I had started speaking up. Mm. And I then felt very unsafe in a lot of the environments that I was going into. And I think that's then really what cemented for me of like, you know what, if I'm going to be self-employed, which I've been self-employed my entire life, I have to build a business that creates a, like psychological safety for me yeah, at all absolutely. times. And I think maybe that's, if anything, that's why I've doubled down and been over communicative about just how queer I am and, and, like, and over communicate my values because I need everyone who's going to hire me to be on the same page so that I can come into a space being my authentic self. Yeah. Because when I do that, when I am my authentic self, I bring a better service. I'm, I'm, a, I'm switched on in all the right ways and my guard is down. So, all my energy is being used on the right things that serve my client rather than having to, you know, protect myself, mask myself, whatever that might look like. And yeah, so I don't uh, like it's not necessarily the here's the one time that I compromised my <laughs> values or no, this is but, where I, but yeah, that's a lesson that I think. Shift, it is a huge shift. And, thinking about how you had to make that transition, not only in your life, but also in your business Mm. and say, I might lose some clients right now. I might not feel safe. But how do I get to that point? That's 
huge. And it mm. might not be the same example for other entrepreneurs, right? In other businesses, but we all have to go through some kind of struggle where we realize, oh, this isn't for me. Mm. Let me move on. Uh, you're also winner of 30 Under 30 for Australia. Mm, yeah, the Out for Australia 30 oh, Under 30. Oh, yeah, love so it. it's a, a list every year. They do a list of 30 influential role models within LGBTQI plus communities. And I was named in the top 30 for 2022, I think. So, yeah, I mean, and that's it as well. I mean, the, it feeds into that Enneagram 3. I really just... There's something about, and one of my values is to be visible, but with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I like to be visible. I like to be seen and seen for who I am, but then ensuring that that's done in order to, you know, feed a, a bigger mission and to have that purpose behind, well, why would anyone ever pay attention to me? And it's not just because I need attention, but it's because I want to speak about something that's actually, you know, making the world a better place and bringing attention to ideas and concepts that I think are, you know, liberating for all of us. If we all are liberated from the gender binary, then we're all in a better position, you know? So that's, yeah. I, so, you know, recognition like that is is always, you know, really, really motivating and energizing. Uh -huh. And I think that is really important because you realize that you have a voice, you're being recognized for that, but you are truly using it to change the world. And whether that is Australia, or you can take it throughout the world, you know, throughout the whole globe. Yeah, that's, that's the plan. Even, yeah. So what is next for Hank Paul? Mm, great question. I think They Connect is, is still a baby company, and there is so much in that company that I am so excited for. Well, so I think focusing on that. But I think the other thing, I'm sitting on a book idea. Ooh. And I've written one book, but I wrote that book for me. Mm -hmm. And the next book I've been thinking about is a book I want to write for other people. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that's in the pipeline. Nice. Is it, and this might be something separate, but for those who might not be able to work with you, maybe they have a smaller brand, maybe they're, you know, the time difference, whatever the case may be, are you going to create a series a webinar, a book series or, you know, workbooks or something that people could workshop to learn from you still. Mm, that's a great idea, Annika. At the moment, I've got, if Google stalk me, you'll find some things about the products that I offer. So, I've got like online workshops for how to inclusify your website. Nice. And that's like a very affordable, accessible thing that people can you know, you can sit for 60 minutes and watch the workshop and actually implement the changes as you watch it. Mm -hmm. So, that's, you know, definitely something I recommend for small business owners and people with smaller budgets. And then my Authentic Allyship Academy is, you know, it's going to come back as well. And that's a mm -hmm. slightly more affordable option for folks who can't necessarily work with me directly. But then, yeah, if you're thinking about running a marketing campaign that is, you know, centered on Pride Month, or you just want some outside perspective on having authentic representation in any of your marketing, mm -hmm. then I would say, you know, come to They Connect and we can offer really, you know, light touch or really comprehensive support depending on what your needs are. So, yeah, there's, I guess, like a, a range of different yeah. options for folks depending on where they're at in their own brand journey. But, yeah, I mean, I'm here to stay. I'm here for good. So, you know, come back in five years when you've got the budget, I'll still be around. <laughs> well, and you're being very inclusive by having a lot of options and a lot of touch points for people. Mm, so yeah, thank that's you definitely for that. part of it. <laughs> yes. Do you have a favorite quote, mantra, some words that help you get through every day? Oh, that help me get through every day. Or just oh, really oh, resonate that... with you right now. I wake up every morning and I have my Google alarm set up to like say, good morning, Hank, your body is beautiful, you are worthy of love. And those are two things that I don't often tell myself. So, Google has to tell me every morning when I wake up. And I think that that just comes to mind. It's obviously, it's the morning while we're recording. So, I've just heard those words already. But yeah, there's something about just if you need a daily affirmation and you can't give it to yourself, just outsource it to Google. 
Your body is beautiful. You are worthy of love. Yeah. What statements? Everybody needs to repeat those to themselves. They do. <laughs> yeah, it's true for everyone. That's right. It's universal. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey, your story, some ideas for ways to interact with your brand, to learn more about how to really be inclusive as marketers. This is so important. And it's not just something like you mentioned earlier, it's not something to be tokenized. Mm. This is, especially for Gen Z, and I see it with my students at uni, that this is just expected, right? Brands need to show their values, they need to live their values, and they need to be authentic. And that means being inclusive, hopefully, (laughs) for every brand. And equity, right? And access and all of the things. They're not just buzzwords. They are Mm. things that we feel really deeply yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm hoping that at least one of our listeners today has been inspired and learned a lot. I'm sure many more have. Hank Paul, thank you so much for being on Your Brand Amplified. And thank you to the audience for coming back for another wonderful episode and amazing speaker giving their expertise for you to learn from. Thank you so much, Annika. And if people are interested, come follow the journey on Instagram. I mainly post my gender queer fashion ideas and tips. So if you want to see what I'm wearing on any given day, then you can come find me there. Yes. And if you're not watching this episode, if you're listening to it, you should go watch it because Hank looks fabulous. <laughs> Hank, I'm looking at your nails going, oh, mine don't look that good. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm, thank you, I've been Annika. remiss. <laughs> Wonderful. And on that note, have a great weekend, everyone. And I'll be back again Monday with another amazing episode. Want more? Check out AmplifyWithAnnika.com or follow me on socials at AmplifyWithAnnika.com.